Hi, thank you for the introduction. So a slight change of um, tech here. Um, so in this talk, I'm not going to talk about new methods to actually assess uh, the treatment, uh, but I'm going to talk to you about new technology that makes it possible to directly act upon it. And that in the form of a hybrid system which combines an MRI with a linear accelerator to allow online MR-guided radiotherapy. So just a disclosure that this project was uh, done in collaborative um, effort with Electa and Philips, and we also received research report on several other grants. So just because not everybody here, um, radiotherapy is its core business, I'm just going to start with a small background on what radiotherapy actually is, and more specific, what a linear accelerator is, and give you a little bit of background on the incre increased use of MRI within radiotherapy. We'll then move on to uh, the actual online MR guidance and talk a bit about the um, hardware considerations um, for the MR Linux. And finally conclude with some new opportunities uh, of research that it's, this new uh, machine will bring. So in radiotherapy we treat patients with ionizing uh, radiation and uh, just as your conventional x-ray uh, tube, this ionizing, ionizing radiation is produced by accelerating electrons and firing them at a uh, positive electrode with a high dense material such, such as uh, tungsten and in this material the electrons get converted to photons by means of uh, Bramstrahlen. Well in radiotherapy um, we use higher energy uh, photons so what we basically do is we elongate this uh, tube and we send the electrons down with RF waves and all in the spirit of uh, Hawaii, you see that some of these electrons actually resemble surfers. They actually travel the big RF wave. Um, they get accelerated up to nearly the, the speed of light, at which point they get bent towards the patient. Again, they hit a um, dense material, and at this point uh, we irradiate uh, photons towards the patients. And this photon beam is collimated by these black blocks uh, called collimators. So in clinic, um, an average linac uh, would look something like this, where the uh, linear accelerator tube is uh, located behind these panels. The beam is then um, bent towards the patient, and in this section over here is where the collimators sit. And um, these two examples show you typical examples of uh, radiotherapy plans. So we basically apply a high dose of radiation therapy by summing um, different radiation beams from different directions, or what we can do is we can circle around the patient and re irradiate from every direction, making sure that the tumorous um, uh, sites receive high dose and uh, reducing the uh, dose as much as possible in the healthy tissues. So radiotherapy is a fractionated treatment, and especially in the old days, it was very important when we only had 2D X-ray imaging and were treating patients with very large fields. Fractionation was the only way to uh, differentiate uh, the effect of uh, um, ionizing radiation on the tumor and healthy tissue. So basically by splitting up the uh, f uh, treatment in um, small fractions that were given on multiple days, we allow the normal tissue to uh, recover um, in between each session. But because tumor uh, cells uh, generally have an impaired DNA rep repair mechanism, the effect on uh, tumor cells is much higher. So if we plot the um, fraction of surviving cells, against the amount of dose that we give, we see the effect on tumorous cells to be much greater than on normal tissue when we uh, fractionate. Well, it's, it's better, of course, to avoid high um, regions of dose to healthy t tissue um, to start with. And around two decades ago, several technological advantages uh, came together which actually allowed this. So the introduction of 3D uh, CT in combination with the increased computing power and the fact that uh, normal uh, modern day Linux are equipped with moving uh, collimators called MLCs really allows us now to um, create very complex plans which look like uh, this, where we can really shape the dose around the tumor sites um, while sparing healthy uh, tissue. With these more conformal uh, treatments, however, the positioning of the patient become, becomes more important. So we have to make sure that the position that we had during our planning CT is exactly reproduced on our um, treatment table. And because of that, modern day Linux is also equipped with imaging um, devices like um, EPID, like um, MV imaging, but also Combeam CT devices. 
So this is what a typical workflow would then look like. Uh, we start off in, in week one where we perform a CT. Uh, we call this a CT sim because we simulate the treatment um, position. Based on this CT, uh, the radiation oncologist delineates the um, targets, but also the healthy uh, tissues that need to be spared. And based on that, computer planning is uh, created. And this plan is then uh, treated for the next two to eight weeks. So we give up to 35 fractions um, on your average uh, radiotherapy treatment. So over the last 10 years or so, this preparation stage, um, MRI got really, um, it's really taken off. Together with other uh, modalities like PET, um, these images are used to better delineate the structures uh, before we actually start a treatment. And just to show you an example of a hypopharynx uh, tumor, you can imagine that if your job is to delineate a tumor here, then having this MR um, images uh, to aid that delineation really helps. So just keep in mind that um, MRI for radiotherapy is not the same as um, MRI for radiology. Actually, we have different goals. Um, the main goal uh, we have in radiotherapy is to delineate the tumor and organs at risk. And we also need to have easy multimodal image registration. And that means that we typically scan patients in the treatment position. Because you can imagine that if you have scanned uh, the patient with the arms down during the preparation phase and then treat the patient with the arms up, you get an internal uh, mispositioning. Um, that's a very obvious one. A more subtle one um, is, uh, for example, shown in this image here. Uh, the anterior coil can uh, deform the body contour. So that's why we typically use um, accessories like coil bridges, uh, but also MR-compatible armrests and even a, a flat tabletop. On the image, um, um, image acquisition side, we also have different requirements. So we typically acquire a high resolution image, uh, ideally in 3D, so we can do the uh, gradient nonlinearity corrections in 3D. And we need to have, make sure that our images are of high spatial integrity. And just to give you an example here, which is presented later on this uh, conference, um, a method called SPLICE, which is diffusion-weighted imaging uh, with a TSE or a fast spin echo readout instead of EPI, is um, now getting regained interest. And um, in this example here, you clearly see that the EPI-based uh, diffusion-weighted image shows large distortion, rendering it unsuitable for radiotherapy planning, whereas the um, SPLICE method gives you very accurate, geometrically accurate images. Here, the same image is shown um, together with the ADC, and uh, you see that it nicely aligns with the acquired PET images here. Uh, similar um, acquisition is also um, presented uh, where they assessed the um, geometric distortions on a phantom study. So, with the proper imaging um, in order, we can really um, start to take use of uh, distinctive properties of radiotherapy, and that is that radiotherapy offers. Uh, the control of spatial distribution of your dose. So we can offer a layered uh, treatment um, where we give a high dose to the macroscopic tumor and decide that the uh, microscopic disease, for example, receives a lower dose because they are at, at less risk. <coughs> so unlike uh, surgeons where um, we need to make a very binary decision of, of what to excise, we can actually um, layer the treatment based on uh, the risk classification uh, spatially. So an example of um, early work um, done on this front using um, multiparametric MRI. An initial study, uh, T2-weighted imaging, as well as diffusion-weighted imaging, and K-trans uh, maps obtained from DC Im imaging were correlated with pathology. And a model was created um, which basically re represents the uh, probability of um, macroscopic tumor or tumorous cells within the prostate. Then in a subsequent uh, phase three uh, trial, this uh, imaging was then uh, used to micro-boost uh, the tumor within uh, the prostate. So where the prostate received up to 70 grays of radiation in uh, 35 fractions, the um, identified GTV, or gross tumor volume, received up to 95 uh, gray. And this study is now uh, closed and the first uh, results are coming out. In the meantime, a second study has started called the HypoFlame. Where, we, where they do the same trick, uh, but then in a hyperfractionated setting, so only five uh, treatment fractions going up to a much ho higher dose per fraction. And with this trend, um, the online guidance becomes much more important. So that brings me to um, 
the um, MR-guided radiotherapy part. And just to borrow um, an old slide of, uh, sorry, can I go back here? Oh yeah, sorry. First, first to uh, just quickly mention this uh, workflow again, you see that um, right now a lot of emphasis is put on the uh, preparatory phase, but the, um, the weak point here still is that the, f the fact that we assume that this situation is valid for the next few weeks. And then if we only have uh, comb beam CT um, images to um, check our position verification, you get a, set, a scenario where you have high resolution MR imaging uh, during preparation phase and this type of imaging uh, during position verification. So with this um, introducing inaccuracies, um, we need to resort to margins around our treatment fields. And there's actually a whole body of uh, literature that describes how to calculate these margins, but basically the effect is that if you cannot make sure on a submillimeter basis where your actual tumor is, you need to refer to higher treatment fields um, with a homogeneous dose, and that kind of kills your concept of dose paint, painting based on the images that you acquire during the preparation phase. And this is the slide that I actually thought was coming a bit further uh, earlier. This is a, an old slide that I borrowed from uh, Jan Lagendijk, who um, actually first came up with this idea in 1999. And uh, the vision behind MR-guided radiotherapy is actually to bring certainty in the treatment process, such that tailoring dose distribution according to cell density and the tumor characteristics uh, becomes um, possible. At the same time, avi avoiding healthy tissue, and with this improvement, improving local cancer radiotherapy. Uh, so basically by seeing what you're doing at the same time, um, making local therapy non-invasive, so surgery without a knife. So a good example to, to show this is, um, for example, the, the treatment um, of elective lymph nodes um, that we currently um, do with breast uh, cancer patients. So uh, whenever there's a sentinel node that is found as positive, breast cancer patients receive a large radiation uh, field on their axillary uh, lymph nodes. And basically the reason why we use such large fields is because the um, treatment fields are defined by anatomical landmarks. We cannot see the individual lymph nodes themselves on uh, CT, let alone on the cone beam CT on the, um, on the LINAC. So we need to resort to large uh, treatment fields. And this uh, inherently introduces toxicity like lymphedema, stiffness of the shoulder, or even uh, infections. So having this type of imaging at your disposal during treatment, you could really zoom in on the individual lymph nodes and start boosting little structures um, in, in the axilla rather than using those large elective fields. So there's several groups now um, taking big effort into uh, bringing these types of uh, machines onto the market. The first one is a commercial uh, system by Vuray, which combines a 0.35 Tesla MRI with three radioactive cobalt sources. Um, the second one developed in uh, Utrecht will come on to uh, later on, and two other um, designs. Um, basically, these four designs differ in the type of magnet that they use or the type of Linux. So um, when we compare these uh, systems, the Vuray system is a split magnet. Um, the Edmonton uh, system is also a split magnet, but uh, using a Linux, shooting the radiation beam between the two um, donut shapes. And the Stanford uh, Sydney system is a similar uh, design, but this time the uh, LINAC is pointing the radiation beam through the hole of the donut, so in line with the magnetic field. In Utrecht, it was decided early on to, to go for a conventional cylindrical um, magnet, so a 1.5 Tesla white bore MRI combined with a modern day uh, LINAC. And basically what we do um, in our design is we shoot through the cryostat. So here you see your normal MRI scanner within brown, the uh, coils producing the main magnetic field and the gradient um, coils. And around that you see a big ring with what we call uh, the gantry. And on that rotating gantry, the LINAC is mounted along with the collimators uh, in red to shape the dose um, to the tumor. So there's a few um, hardware hurdles that we have to take in order to make these two systems uh, compatible. Because um, basically the LINAC uses a big microwave to produce those RF powers. And 
the, um, the, MRI, magnet, the MRI scanner is a very sensitive RF uh, receiver. On the other hand, also accelerating uh, charged particles inside a magnetic field is also problematic. So a few design uh, changes to a standard magnet that um, we needed to overcome was, for example, to adjust the um, active shimming in order to create a thorus or a region around the magnet where the magnetic field is almost zero. So here you see the side view of that magnet by altering these um, shim coils, we are able to produce a field where the magnetic field is zero and in this field, in this ring around the magnet, that's where we place the most uh, sensitive electronic components of uh, the LINAC and also where we start uh, accelerating the electrons. The other uh, thing um, is what you see on this picture is that this doesn't look like your average MRI. Basically, it looks like it's um, behind the panel, and in fact it is. This, this panel is actually part of the Faraday cage. So all the uh, microwave, all the RF components of the LINAC are kept outside of the um, Faraday cage. So basically, we have a U-shaped uh, room where this is within the um, Faraday cage, and everything without, behind these panels is outside. So basically, the uh, cryostat is part of the Far Faraday cage uh, itself. So then, uh, going on to um, the radiation beam, if we follow the radiation beam towards the patient, we see that we are irradiating through the cryostat. In fact, that, that's fine, only we have to avoid that we um, avoid the high-dense material. So the most inner coils of the um, coils producing the main magnetic field are, in this figure, you see this uh, being placed outward, in fact, the, the place upright, and uh, this was possible with, without any loss in uh, B-not homogeneity. Then if we follow the beam a bit further towards the patient, we come um, through the uh, gradient coils, and the gradient set is actually a modified set. We use a split gradient coil with a gap of 20 centimeters to allow that beam to, uh, to pass through. And then finally, we also have to modify the receiver array. Um, the receiver array is different than what you have on your average um, scanner because also these have to be uh, radio translucent. So basically all the ele electronic components of your receiver array are also kept outside that radiation field and moved to the side. And then finally a very practical um, problem that we have to find a solution for. If you see on the left, um, and I told you before that we in Typically, in conventional radiotherapy, we only use one treatment plan, which we then irradiate throughout the subsequent um, weeks. What we do is we, we have a movable table where we locate the patient and reposition the patient until it actually fits that um, treatment uh, planning CT. So we move the patient to suit the treatment plan. Because we have limited space in an MRI bore, we cannot do this trick. We have to adjust the treatment plan to suit the patient. And this is actually um, a necessity, but a very, something that makes um, MR-guided radiotherapy very powerful. We have moved the treatment planning bit, which is normally done only in week one, inside the loop of each treatment session. So uh, what we do on the mr Linux is we acquire a pre-beam MRI. We um, transport the contours, which we may have done in a uh, pre-treatment session, onto the anatomy of the day then generate online a treatment plan, which we then subsequently irradiate straight away. And this is then repeated for every single um, treatment fraction. So moving on to the clinical introduction, um, the fact that this is actually being introduced uh, into a clinic is definite. Um, in fact, Vuray um, has already treated the first patient back in February 2014. And the reason why they um, were very quick in bringing this into the market is because they deliberately decided to <coughs> excuse me, keep a very simple um, machine design where they used a low field MRI combined with three radioactive sources, so no electromagnetic coupling between two devices, just a, um, um, a radioactive source. And the main uh, application right now of this system is to do uh, stereotactic uh, treatments inside the body. So moving organs um, inside the abdomen and thoracic treatments. In Utrecht, we're very close to uh, treating our uh, first patient. Actually, the first in man study is now IRB approved locally. We still have a few more legal steps to take before we can actually start this study. But we were planning on um, performing a first in man study on spinal bone metastasis. 
So this is um, maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but we want to have a very gradual introduction into the clinic. So we start off with a very simple um, uh, patient group where we only deliver one times eight gray uh, to a very static um, uh, target. And this is just mainly to test safety and also the clinical workflow. So um, the way the clinical workflow will look like is that we acquire this uh, pre-beam MR imaging. We then propagate the contours that we have already acquired on a pre-treatment CT onto the daily MR. The online plan is created and is uh, subsequently irradiated. And um, the entire introduction into clinic is actually not only done in Utrecht, it's actually a uh, joint effort uh, within a consortium that consists of seven sites, uh, two in the Netherlands, two in the UK, and three in the US. And we're actually following um, the ideal principles that come from surgery, uh, where we have a very stage design, um, as I just mentioned, where, where stage zero are mainly predicate studies. So in silico studies, uh, where we uh, test the image performance, but also uh, do treatment planning studies to see which patient groups have, will actually have the most benefit from this um, uh, new treatment. Then in stage one and two, where we're slowly arriving, um, those are the technical studies where we test uh, feasibility, but more um, importantly also safety. And we will start off with conventional treatments, conventional treatments that we are already using in um, radiotherapy, but then moving them towards the MLNEC. And then after that, once that's all uh, proved safe, stage three and uh, four will come in, and that those will be actually the clinical studies where we uh, will assess the efficiency, effic efficacy of new treatments, uh, perform dose escalations, um, so higher dose to the tumor while ke keeping a uh, low dose path to healthy tissue and uh, start performing adaptive treatments. And um, we're slowly preparing for that right now. So here's an example. Um, one of the sites that we're intending to treat are um, lymph node oligometastases. And this is showing you two examples um, where in blue you see the tumor, the lymph node and in yellow, the stomach, and this is the same patient uh, imaged over three um, subsequent times. And you see clear differences between the tumor and the organ at risk. And right now, conventionally, we would, we would treat the same treatment plan on this patient. Uh, for the MLNIC, we're preparing automated planning that can take this into account. So another example um, over here, tumor with respect to the um, esophagus, same thing on one day one. They're spaced more apart, but they can move closer together as we go on in our treatment. On a much shorter time scale, uh, we're developing um, techniques to, to do real-time tracking and to account for uh, respiratory motion, for example. And this is also a paper uh, by Burke that I'll present later this uh, week, where she used a particle filter algorithm um, to basically sample where the tumor is at uh, 500 discrete uh, samples. And these particles, they're dispersed every time based on an underlying Bayesian state, state, um, state space algorithm. So um, this algorithm allows for easy parallelization and um, online real-time computing. So you, we can track uh, landmarks in, for example, the liver, as you can see here, um, in a matter of milliseconds per frame. However, having only 2D imaging at your disposal um, is not going to work if we want to accurately track the accumulated dose um, inside the tumor, but also in the surrounding uh, tissues. So, un until we have um, 3D dynamic imaging with, with sufficient temporal uh, resolution, uh, we have to resort to uh, motion models. And this is a paper presented uh, last year by Stemkes et al., where um, we acquire a 4D MRI pre-beam, so 4D MRI meaning uh, continuously acquired data, which is then retrospectively resorted to the respiratory cycle to get an average uh, respiratory uh, cycle in 3D. A motion model is then uh, created using PCA analysis, and within the constraints of this model, uh, reference volume is then registered to the incoming 2D slices that we acquire during beam on. And this is generating artificial um, synthetic 3D CINI data at a temporal resolution of uh, two hertz. Well, this type of work is in ongoing um, improvements. Um, also later on this week by uh, Friedman et al. They actually use the vector fields obtained by this 4D um, MRI uh, sequence with T1 contrast 
to artificially generate a T2 weighted uh, for the MRI because uh, T2 weighted images is mainly the workhorse for uh, radiation oncologists. For the BMON imaging, uh, we also have extensions uh, to this, so extending the single slice image acquisitions to multi slice um, acquisition with minimal um, penalty and temporal resolution. And with all this in place, we can st really start thinking of having on the fly adaptive radiotherapy. Ther so, um, using these synthetic 3D CINE data as an input um, to real time um, segmentation and treatment plan optimization, uh, we can basically compare what we've delivered to the patient at each time point against a dose reference that we've planned uh, beforehand, calculate what's left to deliver, and then re-optimize. Um, and this, this will ensure in the future that for every single fraction, um, the dose is covered, uh, covered to, um, to the target. So in my final slide, I'd just like to uh, conclude um, with all the opportunities um, in types of research that this will, um, will open up. We've seen a few already, so real-time MRI will be important. So not only on the acquisition side, but also on the um, hardware side. So uh, higher channel uh, receiver ray coils that are uh, radio translucent, uh, a bit less of importance for this conference, but uh, actually steering the beam in real-time, so real-time linear control. Something we haven't talked about um, is MR cut or pseudo CT. So methods similar to MR PET are also needed for uh, this type of treatment to do our dose calculations on, and then also the clinical studies. So um, we can expect to see dose escalation studies, which will provide data to do better tumor control probability uh, modeling. So how much dose is needed to get proper tumor control. All this is generating a lot of data. So uh, we imagine that the patients will be treated on an MRI scanner every day. So uh, lots of data is coming in. So also in the field of data science, uh, we'll need solutions for that. And then finally, uh, more in line with this session, functional MRI uh, tooling or multiparametric tooling is needed. We need to translate the methods that we're using right now into the constraints of uh, radiotherapy and into the constraints of these hybrid uh, systems in order to do proper tumor characterization and guide our treatment, but also to do tumor response monitoring and uh, maybe adapt to that while we're treating uh, the patient. So with that, I would like to th thank these people to, uh, for contributing slides and material, and thank you for your attention.